Um, I'm Nira Desai. I'm the Deputy Director of Cocoa Action at the World Cocoa Foundation. Uh, I have to admit, I'm very relieved to be going after lunch. I felt like I was standing between a bunch of hungry tummies earlier. So it's a relief to be presenting now instead. And I apologize, I'm one of the folks with a time constraint, so I will likely not be able to stay for the Q&A, but Laurent has my details, so please do feel free to reach out if you have any questions individually for me. So uh, a little bit about Cocoa Action for those of you that don't know. Cocoa Action is WCF's leading strategy aimed at a rejuvenated and economically viable cocoa sector in two countries in West Africa. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about how that all comes together and what that vision looks like for us. Cocoa Action is a commitment by 11 of the leading cocoa producers and manufacturers working towards a truly cocoa sustainable industry. Uh, and I think what's unique about this effort is this is really the first time that the industry has voluntarily come together to work on cocoa sustainability. So whereas in the past companies have been working individually towards their sustainability goals and there's been a competitive element to that, Cocoa Action is looking at the pre-competitive or non-competitive elements where companies can align and focus on the overall sustainability of the cocoa sector. Cocoa Action companies have committed to reach 300,000 farmers in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire by 2020 through two interconnected packages. And I know we've talked a lot today about the productivity side. We've looked at a lot of the economics of this. Um, and what we are focused on really is both sides of this. So we believe that our theory of chain is predicated on the fact that the changes in the productivity side cannot occur without equal and corresponding interventions in the community. So those pieces are tied together. So for farmers to be able to have healthy, thriving livelihoods, uh, there's also an element linked back to what they're doing on their farms. We, our work is split out into eight thematic areas, and this gives you just a broad overview of how we're broken up. And one of those areas for us is farmer economics. So that means understanding the dynamics and implications of farmer livelihoods. And part of this work is what we're going to talk to you about today. The way the COCO Action works overall is that uh, we're the secretariat, World COCO Foundation is the secretariat, and then we have our company members, those 11 companies that we talked about, that champion the different work streams. So for, um, we're lucky today that two of our champions on um, farmer economics are here with us, Andrew Brooks um, and Keel Hendricks are our guides on that. So this uh, slide gives you a broad overview of how we look at farmer economics. And there's really three boxes here, and I would say the first two are actuality, and the third box is aspirational. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, the first piece is analytics, so that's the bulk of what I'm going to show you today is a farmer economics model that we've developed in conjunction with um, a consultancy called New Foresight out of the Netherlands. And then I'll also talk to you a little bit about some of the research that we're undertaking around farmer economics work. And um, unfortunately, I think, you know, I am probably going to also present um, some challenges, as many of the other speakers today have presented, uh, but hopefully open it up to a space where we can work on opportunities and solutions together. So our farmer economics model, I'll, show, I'll walk you through the different assumptions that go into our model. Um, but it's really, I think it's important also to describe the world word model. So we're not looking necessarily at an individual business case that is the solution or the answer to cocoa sustainability, but rather a model as an economic and analytic tool that companies can use to evaluate different scenarios. So the model is really meant to be used by companies individually, but then also as a collective as we gain real-time data for us to understand uh, what that picture looks like. It's also to help us inform and validate our strategy. So at, again, as we get that real-time data to understand the implications. Um, and also to provide and derive directional strategy shifts. So if we think that in year one we had thought about an intervention in a certain way, and we look at what the outcomes are, and it doesn't end up being the same way, that can help us project and, and look at different opportunities in the future. The model measures overall uh, net income, which in this case we are corresponding to income over time. It also does account for non-COCO sources of income you'll see in the next slide, um, or in the next sets of slides. Uh, there's also 20 adjustable variables. So we're still in the starting phases of this model. It lives 
currently in Excel, we're hoping to bring it online and to add a lot more flexibility and manipulation to it where companies can input uh, additional factors. Um, and those variables can work alone or in combination with each other. The, I think the most interesting part about the model is that it, it relies both on primary and secondary sources. So we've used data from, let's say, for example, ICCO and historical pricing data. We've used research reports from KPMG, but then we've also surveyed and used the company's actual data in building some of the assumptions. And then, as I mentioned, the idea is to incorporate over time real-time data to make that even more robust. And finally, we've been working with external academic experts to also give it um, a further element of fidelity. So these are, uh, there are three kind of categories of the variables that we're considering. The first is around farm characteristics. Some of the basics, obviously, like farm size, your household members, um, the age of your trees, and the density. Farm economics, so these are the inputs, um, the costs that are going into the farm, as well as the cocoa price. And then finally, the details of the interventions implemented. And this gives you some flexibility. These are more the checkboxes rather than numerics, of where you can say, you have either done this activity or you haven't done this activity, and what implications does that give you? So for this presentation, we've run three scenarios. And these are sort of the starting place where we've begun at looking at some different options. Uh, as I mentioned, we're hoping to make this more robust, to be able to run multiple different scenarios to use that real data to, to shape where these uh, scenarios are looking at. And again, every scenario and situation will be different for a company depending on the farms that you're working with or um, the, the situations that you're looking at in terms of your interventions. Uh, for the um, three scenarios, we've got status quo, which means no interventions were done. We have a 3% replanting rate, and then we have a 10% replanting rate. And you can see on the side some of the assumptions that that takes into account. Essentially, no uh, interventions means no gaps, no fertilizer, no crop protection, um, and scenarios B and C take into account some level of that occurring. So when we focus on evaluating the scenarios, what you're going to see this slide is actually some of the outcomes that will come out from the three scenarios. I'll show you the charts in a moment. Uh, but I think you know one of the big things is if we're looking overall to increase productivity, if our goal is really to double yield by 2020, um, we really have to pay attention to what's happening in terms of productivity and income. And I think importantly this morning, we already talked about some of the challenges of just defining that term of what is a livable income. Um, so we've made some assumptions about that, but again, that's still an area that we're working through with many of other partners to really validate what that term means. In terms of the income gap, I think this is the, the news that everybody knows, right? So that if we stick with what currently is existing, income will likely go down for a couple of farmers. If we look at aggressive rehabilitation and replanting, um, that assumes that income will go down as those new plants are generating. And then that also in time then leads to this time lag effect. So what will we do in that time period? How will we help cocoa farmers if income isn't coming in in those years? So this is the, the run of the status quo. Um, and this shows that cocoa uh, income is decreasing over the years. And the main reason really being the old age of the current stock. Um, and you know, I think reaffirms uh, what we already know about the importance of rehabilitation and then also brings for us to light a lot of the needs that are coinciding with governments and with um, the public sector of the availability of planting materials and the rate at which they are coming to farmers. The second scenario is looking at a 3% rehabilitation rate. And what I think is interesting here is that um, that second point is that your cost, the input cost for the farmers stay relatively low. Um, and that's important because that doesn't you know, drop the farmer down into an area where there's a true income lag. However, it's not really uh, accelerating at a pace fast enough where there is big uh, boost in yield. And then in the third scenario, um, we have an initial income drop, which we call an income gap in this case, 
uh, but it's a serious problem. So it shows you that if we do rapid rehabilitation, there's going to be an, a time in an area where cocoa farmers can't provide for themselves just on cocoa income alone. Um, and this assumes obviously no other income from cocoa, uh, from non-cocoa sources. Um, and also, you know, we have to think about the reality of the availability of planting materials in the two countries that we're working in, and when this is realistic to get this rate of planting materials from those governments. So some of the overarching conclusions um, that come out of this are really the critical importance of rehabilitation and replanting, and how do we look at ensuring some of the policy elements around that that stay consistent and also that they're available to farmers. So one of the things this model doesn't take into account, obviously, or two of the things is things like climate change or things like um, elections in a country. We haven't accounted for some of those external factors. Uh, but knowing that, then if we do look at the availability of planting materials, if we are able to rehabilitate at those rates, then what opportunities does that provide for us if there's going to be an income gap for farmers? Um, and that's where I think this comes to the supporting options and, and strategies for us as Cocoa Action and for others to look at. So really that brings us then to, are we looking at crop diversification? Are we looking at loan systems? Are we looking at farmer financing schemes that we can centrally implement that will be effective for all farmers if they are able to rehabilitate at this rate? The second piece of what we're working on is around research. So I think we, again, analytics only get us so far. Um, and here, you know, the, the case really is that we know that the farmers are the true influencers of farm su success and productivity. And so we are looking at funding research in a number of different areas. We're looking at some labor studies. Uh, one of the most interesting ones that we've done this year was in partnership with a consultancy called Institute. And this really uh, looked at what makes up and what constitutes a successful farmer. So they went in um, and did some human-centered design work and worked closely with farmers to identify what uh, successful, what char characteristics make up successful farmers, uh, what they're doing that might be different than their peers, how they can possibly be peer influencers. Um, and then we also looked at what some of the challenges were for less successful farmers. So then we apply some of this research back into the work that we're doing to say, if we understand some of the models now as a business case of what is success, then how can we go and scale this up to other cooperatives that we might be working with or other farmers or create uh, mechanisms of peer influence. Um, finally, I don't have a separate slide on partnerships because to me this comes as the future of COCO Actions Farmer Economics work. Um, our plans are really to look at migrating the model online. Um, and we know there's a lot of other people working on farmer economics models. And our, our goal is to never work in a silo, but to leverage the work that others are doing. So for example, we've put up a few organizations that are doing some other work. Um, but I think the opportunity of conferences like this is really to say, who else is doing work like this? Where can we create partnerships? Uh, I was really happy to see that the previous presentation had the same house, right? What are we going to do together? What opportunities can we create even between now and May to work together to bring some of this research and analytic thinking together? And then obviously applying the research. Um, so I think I will leave you with that question. Um, if you are doing other work on partner economics and would be interested in talking with us or partnering with us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and our goal over time is to, to make some of this research and these tools more widely available. So if you have ideas or opportunities for that, we'd love to hear about them too. Thanks.